Hi, Daniel. Thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be here talking to you. Uh, so you're a busy man right now. Uh, you just got back from your book tour in uh, France. What was that like? And what has so far been the reception to your book, An Odyssey? Well, I always love doing uh, my French book tour, um, partly because their education over there is so much more steeped in a kind of an old fashioned, rigorous, mandatory, classical education. And I just find that they sort of get me over there <laughs> in, in a way that's very satisfying. You know, I think their secondary and higher education still emphasizes a kind of knowledge of the classics. And when I say the classics, I'm not necessarily talking about the Greek and Roman classics, although that's included, but just have a very strong sense of national identity that you have to have read certain things to be a good French person. <laughs> and so I love being there because I don't have to explain anything, um, which is satisfying. So I, I, and it's always nice to be in Paris. Um, right. And so uh, that was fun. I was in Canada for a week. Uh, and that was very satisfying. You know, I've been very lucky so far. The reviews have been very warm, and that's always gratifying um, all over. And um, yeah, so now I'm. I have a couple of days at home, and then I'm. I have a string of things this week. Then I'm in Norway for a week. Then I'm home a couple of days. I'm on the West Coast for a week. I'm home a couple of days. I'm in Texas for a week. I'm in London for a few days. And Palutro Postman. Yeah, I'm pretty polutropos myself these days. But, you know, I love going out with my books and talking to readers and meeting the people who are actually buying the books in bookstores. It's always a lot of fun. And it's the flip side of, you know, writing is so solitary. So it's sort of nice to be in that phase where you're actually out in the world, not being so solitary. Um, that's always nice. Well, I could use a little bit of that solitary thing. At public yeah. school, English teacher, five classes a day, five days a week. It can it can get to be a little much, but I want to I want to yeah. switch over to your book and talk about your book, which I'll hold up for my listeners here. Okay, mm -hmm. the, this is called an Odyssey: A Father, a Son, and an Epic. And your publisher kindly sent me a copy of this. So I have to say, I, I see you as not only a superb classicist, but you're one of my favorite writers. Um, I read you in the in, in the New Yorker. I read your piece about I think it was called an American Boy. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, about Mary Renault and. Um, that's one of the things that I wanted to mention that that um, you find a way to uh, seamlessly interweave the the personal and the private with the with the literary and historical and mythological. You tell stories about your upbringing and your intellectual growth, and you give readers an intimate look at how great works of literature have shaped your identity as a, as a man and as a classicist. Um, in your new book, An Odyssey, this is exactly what you do. You use Homer's Odyssey as a vehicle for understanding your aging father and for examining your uh, complex relationship with him. Um, mm. You use the Odyssey to explore your role as a father, and that was interesting to hear about, and, and also your intellectual coming of age. So I'm fascinated by this question. Of all the books, you've chosen Homer's Odyssey as a lens through which to give your readers a close uh, examined portrait of your life. Why mm -hmm. the Odyssey? Um, and take, take us through your book as well. Uh, give listeners who haven't read your, your new book a brief summary and, and, and touch on this question of why the Odyssey? Well, it's a good question. I can answer it in two ways, basically. Um, there's the sort of clunky practical <laughs> way, which is that the Odyssey, because my dad at the beginning of 2011 asked me if he could sit in on the undergraduate odyssey seminar that i was teaching at bard college where i have this part-time half-time teaching position and so you know that was the course i was teaching and uh and the experience that resulted from having my father as a student in this freshman seminar is the basis of the book and as you I mean just to quickly sketch the structure of the book so the book basically has four parts I guess uh, and there's a, an introductory 
section, um, which I call the proem, which, as you know, is the formal term for the opening lines of any epic where the poet introduces the themes uh, and subjects of the poem. So that's sort of back history, my childhood, my father and I, stuff about his childhood. And then the first major section is about this class, you know, the, the spring semester of 2011, when my father came every week and sat in on my Odyssey seminar, which had some rather comical and also poignant uh, results. Um, and then uh, just as that class was ending in May of 2011, a friend of ours uh, mentioned that she, a few years earlier, had taken a, <laughs> a cruise that recreated the voyages of Odysseus throughout the Mediterranean. And we heard about this and I asked my dad and he said, oh, we have to go on this cruise. Um, so that's the second major part of the book. Uh, and then he fell ill uh, not long after we got back. Um, and so the last part of the book is is his illness uh, and demise. And so that it has sort of three major acts, the classroom, the cruise, and the hospital, uh, preceded by this kind of introductory uh, section. And so, so I could say, well, this is a book about the Odyssey, and the Odyssey is a lens through which to think about my father and me and my relationships and all of that, uh, because the Odyssey was the course he took. The more interesting answer to your question is, I've always felt I had to write about the Odyssey. Um, I myself was trained by two classicists who were great authorities on the Odyssey. Uh, Jenny Strauss Clay, my undergraduate mentor at the University of Virginia in the late 70s and early 80s, a great Homeric scholar, and the Odyssey was her first book. And so I was always sort of shadowed by the Odyssey through my teachers. And I went on to Princeton, where I did my graduate work. And Froma Zeitlin uh, was also very interested uh, in the Odyssey and, and, in fact, wrote a very famous paper about the bed, the marriage bed uh, between uh, that Odysseus builds for Penelope, which turns out to be a great plot point in the poem. Uh, and so I always felt like the Odyssey was sort of shadowing me in some way, and that you know, class, I guess some classicists like to joke that you're either an Iliad person or an Odyssey person temperamentally, and I am definitely an Odyssey person. So am I. Anyone, yeah, well, and I think anyone who has read my other work knows that I'm very interested in problems of narrative and how narrative can substitute for facts uh, sometimes. This is obviously a subject we're all <laughs> very aware of right now in American history, but in a more serious way. A previous book of mine was also a family memoir that had to do with the Holocaust, and I was very interested when I was doing interviews for that book about the way that sometimes people would tell themselves a story about what happened that was didn't necessarily correspond exactly to the facts, but but produced a reality that they believed in. And the tension between the sort of recorded facts and people's version of facts to me was incredibly interesting. It wasn't that they were lying. I think sometimes people convince themselves, you know, that a story is true. We, we you know, we tell stories about ourselves in order to live, mm -hmm. to quote the famous mm -hmm the famous line. And so I've always been interested in narrative. And if you're interested in narrative and the tricks of narrative and the dangers of narrative, you've got to be interested in Odysseus because he is the, the, er, the or figure in Western literature of narrative. He's the great storyteller. He's the great liar. He makes up a whole series of stories and lies and half lies in order to prevail. He's a master of language. He uses puns to vanquish his enemies, you know. So I think I had to end up, just given my interests, I had to end up writing something about the Odyssey. The fact that the Odyssey happens to be a great father-son story, so much the better, because as you know, this is a story about me and what turned out to be the last year of my father's life. So thank you for that. And, and one of my main aims in this episode is to talk about fathers and sons. Um, the Odyssey, in many ways, is an interesting book for me, getting nice and personal here, in the sense that I never met my own biological father. Um, there's a moment in your book, uh, in one of the classroom scenes, uh, in which uh, a particularly incisive student uh, weighs in on Telemachus's dilemma 
um, early on in the in the first few books of the Odyssey when he's looking for his father, um, and the student notices um, that Telemachus quote keeps wobbling in his attitude about his father. Um, in trying to track his father down, he, he quote starts out hopeless, seems to get hopeful, and then goes back again to hopelessness. I'm quoting your book here. Um, Mm -hmm. I can personally identify with this wobbliness. Um, and yet at this point in my life, I can also identify with, with what your student says next, which is that quote, for a boy who never even met his father, the question is, which is the larger crisis living out your life without a father or actually meeting him for the first time, 20 years later, uh, having to get to know him. So Mm -hmm. that to me, as you put it in your book is scathingly brilliant. Um, now, for me, I have an adopted father and a stepfather, both of whom I love, and they're certainly enough for me. Um, but I want to get your point of view. What what specifically does the Odyssey have to say about fathers and sons? And, 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 and how does the Odyssey speak to your relationship with your father specifically? Well, it's an interesting question because I think, you know, many people, uh, you know, many people have some sense of what the Odyssey is about just from popular references. And, you know, I remember when I was growing up, there was an episode of The Little Rascals that had a, a riff on the Cyclops scene. And people who know anything about the Odyssey tend to know one thing, which is that it's a epic poem about a man who's trying to get back to his wife after being separated for 20 years. And 10 years during the war, 10 years during this very adventurous homecoming. But, you know, if you look at the Odyssey carefully, a lot more real estate, as we say in the literature business, you know, is given to the father-son relationship than to the husband-wife relationship, certainly as much. And, And, you know, the Odyssey actually doesn't begin with Odysseus. It begins with his son Telemachus whom he had left as a baby when Odysseus went off to the Trojan War. He's it's now 20 years later. He's a young man. He's never had a father. And he needs to figure out what happened to daddy. Is he still alive? Is he dead? If he's dead, is he going to be the king now? What's the status of his mother, who may be a widow, but maybe not a widow? You know, so, and it actually, the, the first sixth, one-sixth of the poem is dedicated to this son who then goes on a fact-finding mission. That's the first adventure of the Odyssey. It's not the famous adventures of Odysseus, but in fact the adventures of his son, who goes out and interviews his father's war buddies to find out what happened, to try to get some information. So the poem begins with the son searching for the father, who is or will become the hero of the poem. But in fact, the structure of the epic underscores the importance of this father-son business, Because, in fact, you know, so we all know that Odysseus eventually makes it home. He disguises himself. He infiltrates his own palace. He slays all these young men who have been trying to court his wife, Penelope. And he is reunited with the wife. And people think that's the end of the poem. But, in fact, the very final, and he's gradually reunited with all these people he had left behind many years before. But, in fact, the last reunion in the odyssey is not between odysseus and his wife penelope but he then after being reunited with the wife then he goes looking for his father that's the climactic reunion so the structure of the odyssey seems to underscore the fact that it is more than anything concerned with what is the relationship of a son to his father odysseus is in between because he's both a father of a young man and the son of an elderly man. And so much of the poem is expresses a sort of series of anxieties about how do you know your father, right? Eventually he comes home, but he's now 20 years older. He's aged. There's this young 20 year old guy. They have no relationship. They have no history together and they have to come together and become a sort of fighting unit to to vanquish you know the 108 suitors who are hanging around the palace and they have to become a team but they don't know each other and the poem i think and i tried to sort of underscore in in my own book you know the poem has a lot to say about how well can a son ever really know his father and also how well a father can ever really know his son and of course in my book, I'm underscoring a kind of set of parallels between these fictional characters and me and my dad, with whom I did not have a close relationship at all in the first part of my life. 
just till about the age of Telemachus, give or take, until I was in my 20s. And then starting in my 20s, I decided I wanted to know this man a little better. And we eventually became quite, quite close. And so my own story sort of roughly, you know, as an astute reader of my book will see, maps onto the plot of the Odyssey. And, and you could say this entire book is about what I came to know about my own father through the experience of reading the Odyssey with him, having him as a student, going on this nutty cruise with him that recreated the journeys of Odysseus. And, you know, well, it's funny. Anyone who's been in a reading group, and there are many reading groups right now, knows this phenomenon, which is, you know, quite often from people's reactions to a book that you're reading together, you learn more about the, per the reader than you do about the book. Certainly that was the case with me and my dad. You know, I learned so much about my dad from his reactions to the text, which, as you know, <laughs> the running joke of the book is he didn't even like the Odyssey. Right. He disapproved of Odysseus. He didn't think Odysseus was really a hero. He's not a hero. He's not a hero, he kept saying. It was funny because, you know, my dad was a mathematician. He was a man of science. He he didn't enjoy lies and tall tales. You know, he was a straight shooter. He liked equations. He liked things to come out, you know, to balance out mm -hmm. neatly to a zero at the end. And Odysseus, of course, is the master bullshitter of world literature. And my father couldn't bear him. That was the funny thing about the whole course. And so, you know, I really learned a lot about him. And, you know, you yourself jokingly use this word that I make much of in my book, which is an adjective that Homer uses to describe Odysseus, polutropos, which means a man who has many facets, a man of many twists and turns, which is the first adjective in the Odyssey, in the Greek text that's used of Odysseus. It's the first thing we hear about him as an audience. He's a man of many twists and turns. And I thought my father was a simple, straightforward man you know, mm -hmm. until this experience. And it, as you know, he turned out to have some twists and turns of his own, you know, and, and which I learned, you know, through the, the uh, experience of reading the book with him and going on the cruise with him. I learned many things about him. Um, and that was, you know, really very charming, but it turned out he had a, he had a lot of, more facets than I thought of. Um, and, and I was sort of, I was moved by that. I was moved by it so, too. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I miss, I, I, what is that word? I'm like, you know, I underestimated my own, sure. my own father. Um, uh, and that was a kind of a lesson. And and part of that is probably because fathers have to act a certain way uh, way around their sons, and there's a certain side that they show to their sons. I found myself impressed with you in the book. I was impressed at how perceptive and probing you were with regard to your father. I mean, you're up there. The classroom drama uh, scenes in your book were so interesting, were so well written, um, and I just. I, I, I couldn't fathom having my mom sitting in, in, in my classroom. I don't know how you both paid attention to your lesson and uh, sort of tracked your father's, um, uh, you know, identity throughout this process. It, m it must have taken a lot of going home and, 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 and journaling. And, and midway through the book, you actually start writing about your um, father's resistance to see Odysseus as a hero. He kept right. saying he's not a hero, and he gives all these different reasons why. And, and one of the big ones is that the gods keep helping Odysseus, whether it's Athena or Hermes or, or Zeus or some other force. And, and he raises, I think, I'm going to give uh, your father some credit here. He raises an important concern that, that we discussed last episode of this show with respect to the Iliad. We talked about different conceptions of agency in, mm -hmm. in, in the Homeric epics and, and to what extent these characters actually have free will in the sense that we're used to. Um, your father was unimpressed with Odysseus in a lot of ways. And, and in, in the beginning, you said that you kind of thought this had to do with his aversion to religion in general. Um, and, and yet one day, to drive his point home, he, he utters uh, the words that sort of cue you into what's really going on. He says, without the gods, 
Odysseus is helpless. He's helpless. And, and right. this, this was when it hit you. It was that word helpless. You realized that, that for your father, who was a tough man and a self-sufficient man and a, and a do-it-yourself kind of guy, um, Odysseus's willingness to receive help marks him as weak. Uh, right. for your father in some ways. How do you approach this question? How do you respond to your father? Um, how do you respond to your father's challenge with respect to Odysseus? Well, I mean, it was funny. I mean, there's two issues you're bringing up, which are very interesting. I mean, one, you know, I was talking before about how reading the Odyssey with my father revealed things about him that I hadn't really understood. And this was certainly one of them, which is, his inability to see as heroic anyone who gets any kind of assistance, I thought was so poignant because, you know, you just described my father, whom you know a little bit from, you know, reading the book as self-sufficient and a do-it-yourselfer and all of that. But, you know, you also have to remember, you also have to remember my dad was a product of the Depression. You know, he his adolescence was spent in World War II. Uh, and so... You know, I think he had a real horror of, of, but certainly his experience as a child during the Depression gave him a horror of, of feeling like you had to depend on others. You know, you needed a handout. That was his worst nightmare. And I think that was a, a, a nightmare that haunted him and his father throughout the 1930s. So I think there was a psychological bruise from the Depression. You know, but many of the complaints that my father very vociferously raised in class to the character of Odysseus, you know, were actually complaints that scholars have been raising for millennia about the character of Odysseus. Odysseus is not a straightforward hero. You know, I'm not so bothered by the getting help from the gods problem. You know, you're just <laughs> in an ancient epic and that's what happens. It doesn't detract from your innate quality is to receive help any more than it does for people today you know it's like if you're some talented young person and you get help from an editor or whatever it doesn't mean you're you're worthless right it just means sometimes it's nice to get a push in the right direction my father couldn't bear that idea though but many of his objections you know did kind of dovetail with traditional complaints about Odysseus he does lie you know he is a preeminent liar he does rely on the gods he does fabricate stories that suit his purpose he is a little bit shady you know he doesn't always use kosher as it were weapons you know the first thing you hear about odysseus in the the very first story you hear about him is oh yeah i remember that guy he once came looking for poisoned arrows you know poisoned arrows is not a kosher homeric weapon you're not supposed to be using poison arrows. so everything about him is a little tainted i would say and my father who was not a literature person the way you and i are he wasn't a teacher of literature he was a very well well-read person he was a science guy <laughs> he just somehow intuited i think quite correctly you know some of the problems with this character and for him a hero is a very specific thing not necessarily didn't necessarily totally overlap with the Greco-Roman notion of a hero, but for him to be a hero meant you were totally self-sufficient, you didn't complain, you didn't cry, you didn't rely on handouts, and, you know, Odysseus does not fit that bill. That's right, and your, your father did not like the fact that he often well, cries. The crying drove him crazy, because that, for my father, was the word. You can never show emotion. You know, that was a real weakness to my father. And, you know, Odysseus is always crying. At the beginning of the poem, when we first see him, he's weeping, he's wailing, he wishes he was dead. He's so sad to be, you know, lost in the middle of nowhere. My father threw up his hands in despair and said, how could we call this guy a hero? But in, in essence, he's asking a very good question, which is what just what kind of hero is Odysseus right and and in reading your book I as as much as your father uh, seems to me to be a, a you know a, a do-it-yourself you know independent uh, a man of hardness I felt connected to your father um, you, you describe his his penchant for difficulty and precision and and hardness and and yet, you describe a similar hardness, uh, a solidity in uh, in learning languages and studying the classics. And I want to yeah. quote. I want to quote your book here. Uh, you said, um, "When I began to study Greek, 
I found an equally satisfying flintiness, not only in the myths or dramas themselves, but in their bones, the language itself, a syntax that was as stark as Antigone's choices, that allowed for no messiness or approximation. The paradigms of nouns and adjectives that ran across the page of the slim black textbook that we used in Greek 101 were as crisp and as unforgiving as theorems. You, uh, and, and you even say in your book that your relationship with your father as a young, as a young man, was, was, as a young adult, was rekindled by both of your shared passion for rigor. Uh, and, and you suggest that this is one of the reasons that you studied the classics and, and classical philology appealed to you. Your father even said, it's not science. Science is science. Um, can right. you talk about some of the things that drew you to the classics as a young man? And, and, and also, as a, as a follow-up question, can you speak to the health of the discipline at this very moment, both, both in the academy and in the cultural sphere? Well, I think my... I think you know, I, I know I always say this. <laughs> it's a very Odyssean way of replying to her questions. There's always two ways of answering the question. So as I was writing this book and thinking so much about my father and our relationship, it certainly occurred to me that, you know, one, one reason I chose the classics as a field was that subconsciously, I now realize I thought it might please my father because it was so difficult. And my father worshipped difficulty. I mean, this is this was a patent, articulated theme of our childhood. It's not like we felt it. He literally said, you know, a thing is more interesting in direct proportion to its difficulty. You know, he worshipped things that were difficult. And for him, that was the mark of quality, if something was naughty, difficult. And so the classics... You know, when you study the classics seriously, it's a it's a rigorous discipline. You have to master these extremely difficult languages, which in their way, you could see how it would impress a mathematical sensibility. You have to master these paradigms and 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 these sort of metastasizing verbal forms and whatever. And I I think probably it's safe to say that I did choose classics subconsciously because it was tough. You know, it was a tough discipline. That said, there were other factors. And, you know, I'm only quoting a, a now deceased, uh, famous uh, classicist um, called Jack Winkler, who died in the 90s, who I think he wrote an essay once. And he said, you know, naked bodies and lascivious acts. Who can resist Greek mythology? You know, and, and so I'm sure it had a part to do with it. As you know, from reading my essay, The American Boy, you know, as a gay teenager, the idea that there had once been this civilization where it was not a problem to be gay was certainly had its own allure. I'm sure that also was part of the the issue. So I think as with many people, look, we all, there's nothing more interesting than intellectual genealogies, you know, how you get interested in subjects. And to me, it's the most fascinating. And it is, I think, a a mixture of psychological factors, historical factors, and just the random, you know, what hits you, the randomness of coming across something. It's interesting, though, I now think that actually my first great love that I was very serious about was Egypt, not Greece. And yet that ultimately didn't hold the kind of interest for me. I'd learned hieroglyphics. I was a complete nerd. I mean, I was just obsessed by ancient Egypt, but it didn't have legs, you know. And for all the reasons we've just discussed, I think Greece really captivated my imagination. I actually think that, you know, I like to joke now when I have so few causes for optimism of any kind about the national or world scene. Um, I'm actually the only thing I may be optimistic about is the future of the classics. Really? Um, yeah, I think, you know, we're always complaining that, you know, the humanities are threatened and blah, blah, blah. And there's no question that that's, that's true. Uh, but I, my sense is that there is always a hardcore of kids who are going to be interested in this material and they are going to find a way to study it. You know, I, I grew up on Long Island, but I went to university at UVA um, and uh, University of Virginia. And, uh, you know, I was just talking to Jenny Clay, my undergraduate mentor, who's now an emerita professor there. 
And, you know, I think they have 70 classics majors. You know, I think in the South particularly, there's a strong tradition of studying Latin in public high schools. Mm. Um, so, I yes, I think th we're certainly in a sort of dark time. The humanities, expertise, scholarship, all the things that we value as, as humanists are having a little bit of a troubled time right now. But from my own experience, I think there's always young people who are interested in this and they will find a way to do it and look you know when you're a classicist you have a very long view of things right so That's you know right. i was like we've had hard times before you know the dark ages was no picnic but we got <laughs> through that uh you know so i'm actually i'm always struck you know whenever i write these articles that you mentioned earlier when introducing me you know i write for the new yorker articles about Thucydides or Herodotus, there's a new translation of the Iliad, whatever, I get huge responses to these articles. There are a lot of people out there who are interested in the classics, who read them in high school and want to reread them. They read them in reading groups. I can't tell you how many adult reading groups I've been invited to speak at of people who want to know or be reacquainted with the Aeneid or the Odyssey or whatever. I think there's a lot of interest out there. And one of the things that gives me great joy and one of the things that I've dedicated, I guess, my career to is talking to those people. You know, I, I, as I always like to say, the classics are classics for a reason. You know, these texts really are great. It's not like we're trying to sell you a bad car <laughs> and dress it up as a Cadillac. They really are great, you know. And they're great because they say in a very powerful and stylish and original way things about the human condition that have never changed because human nature never changes. The gadgets change. Now we have uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles and the Athenians only had, you know, uh, you know, hoplite warfare. But, you know, <laughs> take away the gadgets and everything is the same. And that's why the classics are classics. They just say these things with great power and we turn to them, you know, because they have great authority. And they're also they're fun to read mm -hmm. i have news for you you know so i'm not actually that's one of the few things i'm not pessimistic about right now i really think and in fact i would say that the darker times are and the more confusing the cultural moment is that's how much more people turn back to the classics for a kind of solidity like that's the bedrock and people always turn to these works when things are confusing and I think that that's something to think about. You know, they don't become less relevant. Sure. They become more relevant. Um, I hope that that's true. And I hope that, that if you're right about this, that that remains the case. Um, and one thing that we might need if we're going to return to the classics is I wonder if, if we need to put down our devices, right? Uh, I was reading uh, great books by David Denby. And he was talking about the one thing that he noticed. He said, you know, kids are just as smart as they ever were. They're just as wonderful. They're just as passionate. But one of the things that he was worried about is he was sitting in, in, in these classics courses at Columbia University. He, he went back and took the, the great books curriculum that he, that he had taken when he was there as an undergrad. And he said that the one thing, the, the big difference that he noticed is that there was, there was, a, there was still a hunger for, for uh, to, to be an intellectual, to, to have knowledge. But he was saying that there was a lack of that obsession, that, that, that um, it, it had been the case when he went to school, there were kids who were just obsessed with the Greek tragedians, and that's all they did. And, and they came to college, and they knew Latin and Greek, and they were utterly obsessed. And I wonder if our attention spans aren't being fragmented. Do you see, do you, see uh, you know, handheld technology and sort of the fragmentation of our attention spans as being a threat to our um, consumption of these long pieces that require a great deal of our unadulterated attention well i think i mean i think this <laughs> i think there's two issues at stake here i think i i do worry about attention spans and i and not only for the students let me say where all of our attention spans are being absolutely uh, uh toyed with by these toys um, that we have i worry about my ability to read far 400 pages of a novel straight without checking my email or my you know so let's not just lay it on the kids i mean right. they're born into this 
world, I was not, but it seduced, you know, not just children, but grownups too. And I think to be fair, we have to admit that I'm worried about everybody's attention span. And it is a problem. It is a problem. Look, I love to tell a story of how when I was a third year student at UVA, I took a big fat Russian novels course. I was a classics major and I thought, you know, I may never get to to take a course like this again. So I took it and I read Anna Karenina in one sitting, I remember. Oh my goodness. Well, it, it's a great novel, I have news for you. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and it was like four o'clock on a Friday afternoon, I started reading, I couldn't put it down. And then it was midnight and 1.30 and 2.30 and I thought to hell with it. And I just read till like five in the morning. I couldn't do that now. No one could do that now because the cell phone would be ringing, the emails would be pinging, the text messages would be coming in. So I worry about that. That's something we should worry about because some of these works, look, especially epics, which are long, complicated works with great many arcs of many different lengths, you have to pay attention to know what's going on. I was sitting on the Amtrak train from New York to upstate New York where I lived about a year ago, and I, I was sitting next to this young guy, who was maybe a college senior, and I was so happy because he was reading, I think it was a huge 18th century English novel like Pamela, something like that, you know, one of those thousand features. And I thought, wow, I'm so impressed by this kid. And then I started watching him read, and every minute and a half, like a Pavlovian dog, he would look over to his cell phone to see if he was getting a message. And I thought, how can you read this book? You can't, there's you no can't, through. Yeah. So that is a worry. On the other hand, I think we should go, always guard against false nostalgia to the great era when everyone <laughs> was excited about the classics. Mary Beard, who's a very well-known classicist, as I'm sure you know, mm -hmm. uh, based in England and writes often, gave a very funny lecture a few years ago that I attended about the history of lamenting the end of the classics. And it goes right back to ancient Rome. You know, even in classical days, people were vetching about how no one was interested in the classics anymore. So, you know, that's just a sort of a cultural, a kind of a built in cultural feeling. We're all and all it means is we're always worried about this material and we're always worried that people will stop caring. That's about true. It. That's but a good in point. Fact, in 2000 years, no one has stopped caring. about. That's it. right. So I think we should balance our anxiety with the, you know, the reassurance provided by history, which is. We've always been worried, and it's always managed to stick around. Oh, you know, great. so that's what I mean when I say I'm a little optimistic. So far, you know, there are still kids in universities, young students who are obsessed with Greek tragedy, and you know, they may not look like the kids David Denby knew when he was an undergrad. That doesn't mean they're not there. They're wearing earbuds now, and they've got piercings and tattoos, but they're still interested. So I do think we have to take a deep breath and not get too to worry. This goes back to what I was saying before. This stuff is very appealing and people will always find that appeal. I'm convinced of it. Well, you're making me feel better. Uh, so <laughs> it, it, in your book, you get the sense that Homer's Odyssey can really can really speak to us today, like you said. Um, and one idea that gets repeated over the course of your book is that the poem itself, the actual words on the page, um, not the, the places necessarily or the mythology or, or the history, but the poem itself is what is real for both you and and your father um, and in, in fact in the act of going on an odyssey cruise um, which was something that you had reticence about um, so I'll just tell my listeners the odyssey cruise that uh, Daniel goes on with his father is a Mediterranean cruise that traces Odysseus's journey in the odyssey your father even repeats this idea on the cruise that despite being on the Aegean Sea and seeing the ruins of Troy etc the poem itself, the words on the page, the 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 story rather than the place, is what feels what felt real to him. Yeah. Uh, can you expound on what on what that means to you? How is the poem? How is the Odyssey still alive for you today? And how did it come alive for your for your father? I mean, you've spent a good portion of your life on the Odyssey. Um, how is it real for you today? Well, I think what my father was trying to express, which of course was very gratifying to me as a teacher of literature and as someone who has devoted his life to writing about literature and writing, you know, is that, so you read the Odyssey, you spend 
five months analyzing it in quite great depth in a seminar. And then you go, you know, you sail off, you take the plane to Athens, you sail to w the place in Turkey, what, which is the site of the ancient city of Troy, and you see a bunch of broken down wall, you know. Obviously, I'm not denigrating archaeology, you know, obviously this is stuff of immense importance, but I think what my father realized in that moment, and again, I emphasize, he is not a person like us who has dedicated his life to literature. You know, he was a, a scientist who was very well read and loved reading literature, but I think that was the moment where it hit him, where, you know, when you when you have mastered a great work of literature, or begun to master a great work of literature, thought about it in depth, it seems to have a reality that is three-dimensional. You know, you talk about these characters, you know, you find yourself talking about these characters as if they're real people. You worry about them, you know. Every time I, wor I read the Odyssey, I, I'm always afraid Odysseus isn't going to make it to the end. You know, it seems to have a kind of three-dimensional breathing reality. And I think it hit him for the first time being in these ruins of these places which are so vividly described in the poem. That this is a different kind of reality. And he said that famous line, which became the sort of mantra of the cruise everywhere we went. It's interesting, but it's not as real as the poem, which, of course, is very gratifying to me, and I think this is an experience, you know, this is, uh, interestingly enough, an experience that Proust describes a lot in his novel, the, the slight disappointment of finally seeing a place you've thought about a lot, and it never quite matches your imagination. So it's really a kind of a tribute to the power of the imagination, which can reconstruct out of the seven broken columns the whole temple. Well, if we were all like Proust, we could just line our walls with cork and yeah. just, you know, reinvigorate Combray. Right, exactly. But that's what we do. You know, that's what I think it was the moment when my father actually saw what literature can do, that it's not some idle pastime, but it is, does a real thing in the world, which is constructs a satisfying experience, if you think about it. Obviously, I think the Odyssey has meaning you know i mean obviously i'm pleading my own cause i'm a literature person but if you're a literature person literature is not icing on the cake of life it's not something you get to do in your free time it's not something you get to do if you have a spare moment after you've made your money or whatever it is the thing that gives meaning to life that's what we turn to when we want to know what life is about and certainly what my book is about is how much I learned to appreciate about what the Odyssey can tell you about not only fathers and sons, although that's a lot right there, but also dying. You know, the Odyssey, the metaphor of the Odyssey is about a journey that becomes so interesting, it's in danger of, you, you know, he, he becomes in danger of not getting to his destination, right? He, he, he accidentally lands in so many fascinating places and meets so many fascinating and creepy and monstrous and beautiful, exotic aliens and <laughs> creatures and whatever. It's really a kind of a proto-science fiction narrative that he almost doesn't make it home. And I, it's so clearly a metaphor for life, right? Mm. That it is the journey that's interesting because the de we all know what the destination is. That's not so interesting, you know. And at one point, as you know, my father reflected on this, this kind of paradox, which is, you know, getting home means dying in a way. It means the adventure is over and the adventure is life. So I think the Odyssey has great kind of symbolic power as well about a, it's a parable about living. You know, look, it's, it's also obvious Lee, as I discussed with my father on the cruise, a prototype for the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, I remember that. It is a Wizard of Oz. And what is the Wizard? Everyone knows what the Wizard of Oz is about. It's about the power of fantasy and the power of imagination and appreciating home, which is only possible after you've been away from home. You know, so uh, this is a text that has you know, is so enormous in its implications about family relationships, about what marriage is like, about what children can understand about their parents, which is a huge subject, or rather what children will never understand about their parents, which I think is one of the great lessons about the Odyssey 
which I didn't understand until I had this particular experience about fathers and sons, husbands and wives, you know, adventure, journeying, what it means to come home again. What does home mean? What does home mean? Actually, we talk about it so much. And I, I'm just, and the final, you know, a thing, another thing I want to say about the Odyssey is because, see, my father had a problem with Odysseus because he was so complicated. He seemed to be heroic and powerful. He's a great warrior, but he needs help. He's incredibly brave and faces these weird aliens, but he cries a lot, you know. And, he cheats. And, and he cheats, but also, you know, he wants what's his. You know, he's happy to cheat other people, but he ins- the whole point of the poem is him coming back and reclaiming his property, his wife, his palace, his kingdom. And I, you know, as someone once said to me, one of my teachers, my father's problem looking at the Odyssey is he was seeing the complexity as the problem rather than the solution. Right. That's who Odysseus is. Right. He is a complicated character. He is not reducible to good or bad, brave or cowardly, you know, impressive or skeezy or, you know, and I, I think particularly in a culture right now that wants to keep reducing everything to winners and losers you know thumbs up thumbs down five tomatoes no tomatoes five stars zero star <laughs> you know i think one of the greatest things about the odyssey is that it is, it is an argument for complexity for the virtues of complexity that you don't want to keep reducing everything to facile pre-chewed pre-digested quantities that that the real point of life is struggling with complexity and appreciating complexity and the odyssey does that by giving us one of the most complicated heroes in western literature and i think it's an invitation to look at our own lives and to stop looking for you know keeps raising the question who is odysseus and the joke is he's many things at once as most of us are you know most of us are one thing with our parents, another thing with our lovers, another thing with our children, another thing with our friends. You don't show the same Jordan Alexander Hill to your uh, college buddies as you do to your great aunts. So does that mean you're hopelessly indecipherable? No, it just means you've got many sides like Odysseus. And, and if you see people in their totality, you will have a much healthier understanding of life. Right. That's, that's, that's what the Odyssey is about. I was able to do with my father, finally, in a way I was never able to do with him before. That's a, a really beautiful way to think about, uh, about the Odyssey. Um, and speaking of complex characters, uh, one of the chapters in your book is called uh, Homo Frosine, uh, mm-hmm. which you translated. You translated all of the, the, the Greek in your book, which I was really impressed with. Um, and Homo Frosine means like-mindedness right? Mm-hmm. Especially between two people in a relationship. And in many ways, the Odyssey is is not just about uh, a complex man and his journey home or a son's journey to find his father, but it's also about uh, a wife, Penelope, waiting for her husband, uh, a wife who is trying to conceive of her identity after 19 years. Um, I'm sure the last 10 of which were very agonizing, Right. Uh, she has to ask herself, am I a wife or am I a widow? Um, right. Should I remain steadfast in my loyalty to my husband? Or should I, or, or is my husband dead? And in, in, in which case I have to remarry. So there seems to be no sign of Odysseus coming home. The suitors are pressuring her. Telemachus, in my opinion, w- isn't capable of being the man of the house. Uh, and I was thinking about this and, and in the world of the Odyssey, in, in ancient Greece, a woman couldn't just have it all. You know, she, you, you had a role. Yeah. And uh, Penelope has to make a choice, right? So, Daniel, how do we conceive of Odysseus's relationship with Penelope? And, and how do we regard Penelope as, as a character in a world where you don't have so much independence if you're a woman? And, and then lastly, are, are Odysseus and Penelope actually like-minded? Well, it's a great question. I mean, there's, you know, one of, just as the Odyssey keeps landing Odysseus in different new lands, islands, continents, where he meets new civilizations, he's like Captain James T. Kirk, Mm -hmm. basically. I thought about that. Which is another Odyssean 
text, actually, the Star Trek, right, that you're going to go on this, you know, mission to boldly go where no one has gone before, which is what Odysseus does. And, and implicitly, through interacting with these other civilizations, other creatures, aliens, whatever, you appreciate your own. You, you come to understand what your own means. You know, Odysseus, in a way, can't go back to Ithaca until he has had these adventures, because it's only after having these adventures that he can appreciate Ithaca. Interesting. And it's, right? Which is notoriously poor and rocky. It's not an opulent, lavish, wealthy island. And yet he still wants to go home to it because now he can appreciate it, having been to all the other places. And the, the reason I'm saying that is it's an exact parallel to Penelope. Right. One of the things the, the Odyssey also gives to Odysseus is the opportunity to hook up with all these fabulously beautiful <laughs> goddesses and nymphs. And, you know, he gets around. He's not he's not celibate in 20 years. There's, I think, also a strong suggestion that he has a little thing with Helen of Troy um, and uh, who is, you know, so he keeps meeting potential mates as well as potential homes. Because the Odyssey is always sort of raising the implicit question, why not just get off on one of these other islands with beautiful, lush vegetation and stay there? Why like do you Calypso. have to get off? Yeah. Right. And so it's also asking, what's so special about Penelope? You know, after all, these goddesses are throwing themselves at Odysseus. For seven years, he's kept prisoner by N Calypso the nymph Calypso, who's more beautiful than Penelope could ever be. And Penelope's mortal. She's old. She's now a middle-aged lady. And Calypso will also be young and beautiful. In fact, she offers him immortality, right, um, in return for staying with him. And he says no. So that, to me, is one of the most moving things in all of Western literature, right? He, he chooses death in order to have Penelope. So that raises the question, what's so special about this girl, okay? And we get to see that as the poem unfolds. At first, she's a distraught, rather passive character. She doesn't know how to, you know, she's tried to think of all these stratagems to keep the suitors at bay. She's at her wit's end, you know, where at the moment where you think she's finally just going to give in and marry someone, just get it over with. And of course, at that very moment, he comes home. But Odysseus himself, in a very famous passage, in fact, talking to one of these other females who was offered as a potential alternative to Penelope, the beautiful young princess, Nausicaa. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he's telling her, I'm going to tell you what, you know, what a good relationship is. And it all depends on this thing which he calls homophrosune. And what is homophrosune? Homo prosune is, you know, um, like-mindedness, right? To have a similar way of thinking to someone, I think, is the best way you would translate it if you wanted to be very literal, right? To think in a similar fashion. Why is that so important? And by the end of the poem, Penelope demonstrates that she is, in fact, just as tricky, just as polytropos, just as many-sided, just as clever with words, just as conniving as he is. So, in fact, she demonstrates that she is the right woman for him. Um, and it's important because as time passes, you age, you lose your physical charms. It happens to everyone. Wait and see, you know. And, and, and so the Odyssey is... I would say not only an argument for complexity, but an argument in favor of interiority. That is, the inner self is unchangeable. And that's what you're really drawn to in a healthy relationship. It's not the body, the biceps, the, the boobs, the thighs, the, you know, everything that everyone is spending two hours every day in a gym trying to have. And I can tell you, by the time you're looking at 60, it all sags anyway, right? So that's what the Odyssey is about. It's what really makes someone, what really draws you to someone. What really is sexy about people is their mind. You know, I always say Odysseus is a sort of proto Woody Allen, right? Because he demonstrates that mind is the sexiest thing. And that's what, that's what ultimately connects people. 
you know, I, you know, if everyone spent two hours a, in a, a day instead of in the gym working on their quads and went to the library for two <laughs> hours a day working on their souls and their minds, we'd have a lot better relationships. So I think that that's the importance of Penelope in the poem to some extent is she is, you know, appealing to him because of who she is, not because she's beautiful like these goddesses are, you know, that. And also it raises a very interesting question, which I think we're still interested in today, which is that you feel like there is one person for you. Right. For whatever nutty reason. Your father mentions this. Yes, my father, that he got. He, look, and that one of the climaxes of the book, as you know, is when my father, who was hardly emotional and not given to sentiment, suddenly when we were discussing exactly what you and i are talking about now homo prosune and the climactic reunion between odysseus and penelope when penelope tricks odysseus into revealing that he's really odysseus um in a very odysseus like way uh you know my father suddenly said well i can tell you what it's like to be married to someone so long that they don't look like the person that you married anymore they're not the beautiful young girl you married and yet you're still connected you know and so he was talking about my mom and you know most of these kids they're 17 years old my parents were together for 64 years it's you know three times more than three times as long as their whole lives Right. And they can't yet appreciate the wisdom of the Odyssey, which is what truly connects you is not the surface fun stuff, let's call it. You know, it's these other things that you have with someone. And I, I think Penelope really does pay off in the end. She is an impressive figure. She has just as many troubles as Odysseus does. In fact, one of the climactic moments of the odyssey when they finally are reunited and she's now accepts that it's he because remember they don't look the way they did when they last parted you know she was 20 he was 21 now she's 40 he's 41 whatever it's when homer at the moment when you know they finally break down in tears and embrace each other and he says she is like a sailor who has been shipwrecked who mm. finally finally sees land again and he's describing penelope which is a simile that likens her to odysseus who really has been shipwrecked as we know right that's one of the most recurring themes so she's had her own adventures even though in some ways you know superficially they're opposites he travels endlessly she sits at home all the time in the same place right you know, they seem to be opposites, but ultimately they both had their terrible trials and adventures, and that's why they're matched. It's a real, you know, we say people are really matched. They are really matched. They are, they're not identical, but they both have suffered. They both have had to prove themselves. They have both had to use their wiles more than physical force to maintain their positions you know, and maybe she more than he, because she has fewer tricks, you know, she has fewer um, tools at her disposal. She's a woman, she can't fight, she can't battle people, she can't put on armor and drive the suitors away by force of arms. She's got the loom. Yeah, she's got her famous trick with the loom, weaving this shroud and secretly unweaving it all the time. You know, so I think she is an impressive character. I was just having an exchange with a classics professor who who had read my book and she said well you know but don't forget that the real match for odysseus the, the real homo for Sune may not be penelope it may be athena his divine protectress you know athena is always looking out for odysseus and they clearly enjoy each other a lot there's a lot of banter but you know they're not really matched because athena is divine and she's going to live forever. And Odysseus is getting older, as we all are. And so it's a nice idea, but ultimately I don't think they're ideally met. Odysseus and Penelope are met. And so this is also the story of a marriage, and, and a very poignant story of a marriage, most of which has been taken place in absentia, right? They were a young couple with a newborn baby when he went away. So most of their marriage has been absence 
And yet they still come together in a very satisfying way at mm. the end, which means there's something really there. Yeah, and she's strong too. There's there seems to be this yep. inner core about her. She's she is a strong woman. Um, so the, the last thing I want to touch on uh, for for our interview here is um, a, a particular interest to this podcast. Um, in in 2014, you wrote uh, a short essay for the New York Times. It was it was like an op-ed. It was you and another writer. You were giving opposing perspectives on Harold Bloom's book, The Western Canon, uh, mm-hmm. and how it would be received nowadays. I found Bloom's book uh, an inspiration and a big achievement. Um, not for anything profound that the book said or 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 put forth, but for the fact that in an age of ideology. Um, in an age of identity uh, that I was impressed that someone like Bloom was sticking his neck out and unabashedly praising the idea of an authoritative canon. And I wanted to get your take on on canons, the, 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 the intellectual question uh, uh, or the scholarly question of literary canons. Um, he, in his book, he's, he's making the case for a canon. Uh, he's making the case for reinstating aesthetic criticism which is not is not in fashion uh and and a return to seeing imaginative literature as something that is fulfilling and and ultimately something that can be a deep pleasure um in your article you defended the canon you said that while there was justice on both sides of the argument um ultimately literary canons are important even as they progress and become more inclusive that's great uh, that in the internet age, the determination of this canon can be even more democratic nowadays um, and less elitist. Do you still feel this way, Daniel, in 2017? Do you feel um, in the throes of what seems to be another culture wars, but an even uglier one? Um, how do you think the idea of, of a Western canon is faring? Like, What's your take on this at this point? Well, I, you know, I think... I think- you know, whatever we may think, it's there. You know, we may wish it were otherwise, but I have, you know, you could first say that the Western canon is there, right? You you can treat the canon descriptively. There is this body of work. It has right. shaped writers and thinkers in our civilization for the past 2,000 years, whether you like it or not, whether you wish they were different books or different writers, you know, sorry, but those are the ones... They shaped the people who created this nation. They shaped the thinkers of this nation. So, so even if you object to the specific items in the canon, it's there. You can't wish it were otherwise. And even if you don't like them, it's your responsibility intellectually to know them, I would say. So that's one way to do it, what I call the descriptive approach. This is The, the Western canon is Plato, Aristotle, Euripides, Sophocles, Dante, Homer. Shakespeare. You can't make that go away. Well, you can you can erase it, right, in the collective consciousness. No, you cannot teach it, but it's still going to have done the work that it did. You know, it's like gravity. You know, you can pretend <laughs> that gravity doesn't exist, but you're going to fly in an airplane and it's going to fly because those are the laws of nature. The same thing with the Western canon. It did exist. It has existed. It has shaped the world we live in. If you want to understand the world you live in, I have news for you. You have to know the Western <laughs> canon as traditionally defined. That said, look, I'm a gay person. I didn't necessarily see myself reflected in the works of the Western canon that I read when I was a student. And obviously now canons as defined and taught in universities or high schools, obviously, are adapting to the current world. Right. So there's the what I was saying before, the canon is traditionally defined that exists. You have to know it if you want to understand the world we're in. But obviously, canons are necessary. The canon is shifting. It is expanding. Right. When I went to college, Toni Morrison was not a canonical American author. And now she is. And that's a good thing. Yeah, I agree. Because she in her works is describing an aspect of American experience, which is vital crucial and unignorable, and she has done a great job of writing about that. So we can name any number of other people who are now part of the canon, but we will always need canons because the canon is the body of work that expresses the values of a culture at any given moment. 
So there's the historical canon, which I was talking about before, but there's the living canon, which expresses who we are and who we now are, hopefully, is more inclusive. <laughs> and it, it, it has, ex so who we now are, say, as Americans, teachers of American literature, has now expanded to include James Baldwin, Toni Morrison, uh, uh, you know, Richard Wright, Richard, Ralph Ellison, Richard Wright. Okay. That's about race. So we're obviously dealing with race for the first time in modern history in a way that includes these great texts by African American authors as part of the American canon there. I'm sure the same could be said of any other number of identities, right? That the canon has adapted and expanded as it must, because they are now part of our values, hopefully now include inclusivity, multiculturalism. So I'm not, you know, again, I'm not pessimistic about this. You, but you have to think about the canon in a complicated way. There's the, the historical canon, which shaped our culture, for better or for worse, you need to know it to understand where we are now. But the, can, the living canon of authors whom we want our young people to experience in order to understand the world we live in, which is different from the world as it was 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 years ago. And I think in that way, it's a much healthier way to think of the whole problem. I don't see it in these apocalyptic <laughs> terms. But right? I think, Daniel, that you and I would probably both agree that um, rightfully so, that, that Toni Morrison and James Baldwin and Ralph Ellison and, and these other great writers that are part of the canon now are not part of the canon because a, an individual group, an identity group, saw themselves in Toni Morrison, but that Toni Morrison speaks to things that are that are universal to the human experience that we someone over here can say that that Toni Morrison's writing about race but I, I can say that she's writing about alienation and 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 violence and anxiety and and modernity and right I think you're right but I you know I again I think and I'm not trying to sit on the fence but <laughs> I can see both sides of the argument right no so I totally get what you're saying if Toni Morrison were only writing about, say, a black American experience to reduce it in a horrible way, mm -hmm. just for the sake of argument, in a way that had no artistry, no larger application, no universality, then it would just be, it would not be canonical. You know, things that are on the canon are also understood to have a kind of largeness and you know weirdly enough and this is the paradox of liter literature it is through brilliant specificity that literature achieves universality hmm. so Toni Morrison writing beloved is writing about a certain group of people at a certain moment in history about a certain story in a certain specific culture but because art is art I as a white male can read Toni Morrison and feel that I understand it, just as I would hope that Toni Morrison can read Homer and see it as about something other than dead white people. Yeah. Right? It works both ways. Right. And in fact, I said to a student of mine, I was teaching a great books course at Bard, the second half of our mandatory two-semester first-year great book sequence. And I had a fabulous young woman in class um, was a African American girl, and she was the only African American in the class. Which he instantly raised and said, "You know, we need to talk about the fact that I'm the only African American." And we did, and it was very productive. And you know, and at some point, you know, she said, "Well, sometimes I feel, why do I have to read these works by these dead white European guys?" And I said, "You know, I understand what the objection is. We're all talking about this. We're all sensitive to these issues. We're trying to." make our canon more inclusive, more multicultural. I said, but be careful of that argument, because if you can't read Plato, because he's a dead white male, and you're a young black woman from South Carolina, then I can't read Toni Morrison, because <laughs> I'm a white guy, and she's a black woman. That argument cuts two ways. And right. what one really hopes for in thinking about this, and as I get older, and it may be naive, I really feel that what one, what, one wants to be cultivating is a larger human identity, irrespective of sub-identities. Not that those are not important, because they are part of who we are. Mm -hmm. 
you know, but that there is some larger commonality that human beings share. And that's why we can read other literatures. That's why we should read other literatures. If right. it's only about me and my specific narrow experience, then I'm not going to learn anything from other literature. And so, you know, it's a complicated question and, and, and one wants to be sensitive to all the issues. But I do think that what makes great literature great and therefore worthy of being in a canon is precisely its ability to transcend the particulars of its own narrative and to somehow speak to a larger experience. Look, I can read Jane Austen. I have read Jane Austen. I frequently reread Jane Austen, which is a canonical Anglophone author. And I'm not a, you know, British spinster of the early 19th century. And yet there's something about Jane Austen that seems to me to say, you know, be about being a person, a human person that is larger than the particulars of its own story. Not that the particulars aren't crucial. Right. That's the trick of literature. Right. That's why we love literature. So I feel very strongly that we should be spend more time thinking about the universals than about the particulars, or at least balance them in some way that's productive for everybody. Thank you so much for, for joining me and spending your time with me, your valuable uh, time. I'm sure you don't have a lot of it right now, but I really appreciate it, and I really enjoyed this conversation. Well, so do I, and this is, you know, this is what I'm happy to talk about, so it's not a drain on my time. It's what my time is for. Thank you so much. Keep it up. Keep doing Thank the great you. work that you do. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.